outcrop of the day today is this huge boulder of microgranite and it is chock-a-block with beautiful myrolytic cavities. If you haven't seen them before, it's these irregular cavities in the granite that are lined with euhedral crystals of quartz, feldspar, and in this case there's a little bit of gossenafter sulphide. Sometimes you see muscovite and occasionally cassiterite. In this big one here you can see lots of nice euhedral feldspar crystals growing into the cavity there. And then there's lots of big hexagonal quartz crystals growing into the open space here. There's a really big one there. They're interesting because they're evidence of the exact moment when hydrothermal fluid exsolved from a crystallizing silicate melt. When rocks are melted into magma, it can contain somewhere between about 1 and 20% water, depending on the source rocks, the pressure, and the melting processes involved. Granitic magmas derived from the melting of sediments tend to have the highest concentrations of water. A silicate melt is basically a soup of randomly arranged ions and molecules, but as it cools, the atoms arrange themselves into very neatly ordered structures that form mineral crystals. Most of those crystal structures have very little room for water molecules. So as the crystals grow, the water molecules are excluded into the remaining silicate melt, and their concentration increases. If the magma is rising through the crust as it's crystallizing, the pressure will fall, and that reduces the maximum concentration of water that the melt can carry. At some point, the remaining melt will become water saturated, and any additional water excluded from the growing crystals has to come out of the melt as a fluid, so it forms bubbles. Like most combinations of solids, liquids and gases, the bubbles tend to rise and the solid crystals tend to sink. So it's no surprise to find that myrolytic cavities are most common near the tops of granitic intrusions. The bubbles grow and get pushed out of shape by the growing crystals and the movement of the magma. Some of the ions from the surrounding melt dissolve into the fluid bubbles, particularly elements that can't fit into the structures of the growing crystals. So the fluid becomes enriched in things like chlorine, fluorine, sulphur and some metal elements. The last remaining melt surrounding the bubbles commonly develops graphic intergrowths of quartz and feldspar that characterise crystallisation of fluid saturated melts. When the remaining melt is fully crystallised and the resulting rock begins to cool, elements dissolved in the fluid bubbles begin to precipitate out as new minerals on the walls of the bubbles. Because they're growing into cavities filled with fluid, the minerals form perfect euhedral crystal shapes. Feldspar and quartz are usually the first to grow, and they're followed by minerals that use up the more exotic elements in the fluid. So it's common to see minerals like fluorite and the sulphides that are indicated by the gossen in some of these cavities. So myrolytic cavities are really ancient time capsules that preserve a remarkable record of the fluids and elements that were once dissolved in magmas many kilometres below the surface of the earth. They're important from the perspective of mineral explorers because the mechanism of formation explains why magmatic fluids can contain high concentrations of the metals we look for. And if those fluids manage to escape into veins, breccia pipes or scarns, they can make ore bodies. Each one of these cavities is essentially an irregular vein. Euhedral crystals growing into the cavity tell you that there was open space at the time that the crystals were growing. And the fact that they're growing in there tells you that the crystals were precipitating from something, and that something was a hydrothermal fluid, just as you would find in a quartz vein or a pegmatite. You might wonder why, if they're like quartz veins, then why don't they have alteration halos around the outside? Well, there's a good reason for that because the fluid was exsolving from the melt surrounding it, so the fluid was exactly stable with respect to the surrounding rock. So if it's stable, then there's not going to be any chemical reaction between this fluid in the cavity and the surrounding rock. That's another really good piece of evidence to tell you that this fluid came from here, not from some external source. In almost every hydrothermal mineralization system that's ever been studied, there's an argument between how much of the fluid involved was derived from a magma and how much was meteoric. But in systems like this, 
you've got 100% clear evidence that there is fluid coming out of the magma. So there's no argument involved. That's why I really love these little cavities because they're evidence written in stone that hydrothermal fluid really does come out of magmas.